you, me, you, will you, then I can show you some terrible things. Illegal weapons, burning skin, and look at this, and you think, oh my god, look at that state. All the folks, they displace, they want bombs, so we play. Artists are speaking up for Palestine in the belly of the beast in the United States, which is Israel's largest financial backer. Musicians, actors, and other artists have been fired, dropped from labels, or otherwise sanctioned for openly supporting Palestine. But that has not stopped the Palestine solidarity movement within the cultural sphere. People's Dispatch spoke to Leila Higazi, a musician from New York City, whose ability to adapt popular songs to spread a pro-Palestine message has garnered quite literally millions of views. We ain't ever gonna shut our mouths Cause everywhere in Gaza now They're surrounded by so much pain Baby, this ain't how the defense goes This shit is inhumane This genocide is not a war But martyrs don't die in vain Baby, this ain't how the rest goes We're gonna see a brand new how did you start making music? Thanks for having me. Um, I started when I was pretty young. So, you know, I've been singing since I was five. I started playing piano when I was 10 and like writing songs around that time. So um, yeah, it's been a really long time. What has making music meant to you personally throughout this genocide? You know, for the first like month into it, I don't think I was able to do much of anything. Um, but then at some point, I think it was like around Christmas time, and I was sort of just watching everybody go about life as usual in the United States. And, you know, especially in New York, like Christmas is a big thing in New York. And I started for whatever reason, just like singing Christmas songs with lyrics about Palestine. And like, it, it started out just being kind of like, I don't know, this sarcastic thing that I would do to vent my rage. And then, I don't know, at some point people actually started listening and then I started covering pop songs and it, it just sort of happened from there. I guess like this has been my own way of coping. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that occurs to me is that like as someone who deals with um, dynamic disability, which can change, you know, day to day, um, I can't always make it to protests. Like I never know how I'm going to feel that day, but I generally have the strength to sit at the piano and like, you know, write, which is has, I think, been the primary way that I've dealt with these horrific things, how I've coped. What is the role that art and culture can play in stopping genocide? You know, sometimes I feel like when we talk about Palestine, it's like, it, you can feel like you're screaming into the void, right? Like, there's the people who really get it and have always gotten it. There's the people who, I guess, are just starting to get it. And, you know, I think public discourse has changed a lot in like the past like several months in a way that we've never seen before, especially in the United States. But, you know, it's like, it just occurred to me, like, if they're not getting it when we talk, maybe they'll get it when we sing, you know, or maybe they'll get it. You know, there's a way that art forms sometimes can reach people um, who may not necessarily, you know, be reading the news or following um, politics in the same way that others are and you know I just think that art has always reflected the times and it can be a really powerful tool that we shouldn't take for granted. How would you like to see fellow artists and musicians stepping up for Palestine? You know I think what I would like to see is first of all just basic recognition because I think that there's so many people right now who are sort of just trying to go on like as as if there isn't a genocide going on. So there's still, you know, especially in the music world, I'm still seeing people like release songs like there's nothing going on. You know, they're still, you know, just kind of playing shows as usual. And I'm not saying that, you know, I mean, if you're a musician and you're a freelancer, like obviously we have to work. This is our living. I understand. But what I want to see is like, well, you know, are you at least using any platform that you have to speak about this? Because if you're sort of just going on business as usual and you're not acknowledging this in any way, especially, especially when you've acknowledged other crises in the world, as so many artists often do, 
Uh, it really makes, I think your silence is such a strong statement and we're very aware, you know, especially like the Arab American community, like of how racialized your silence is. Um, and I just, you know, I want people to feel like, especially artists, um, like they can come out and be their true selves and speak when they see something wrong. And if they don't understand that something's wrong, I hope they're at least educating themselves and, you know, following people or listening to voices that are maybe more educated. Um, but yeah, I do think that there's a point when like your silence is just complicity. So, you know, if you haven't spoken up by now, it's not too late, please do. Um, and that's whatever your art form is, like your voice matters. And like the idea that, you know, we're all kind of, I don't know, separate from what's going on. Like anyone who's able to like separate from this, I just, sometimes I want to shake them. I want to be like, you know, we're, if you think this doesn't affect you, like you're broken too. Like this is, <laughs> you know, I think we've really lost the ability sometimes to empathize with people in a certain part of the world. And that disturbs me deeply, especially when I do see people speaking out about other issues that matter, but they're silent on this. So it's, you know, it speaks volumes. It really does. I feel like there are certain issues that um, there are, I want to say there is enough voices coming out in support of certain people <laughs> that people sort of feel comfortable like they have like they won't lose everything if they speak about those issues. And, you know, whether it be like black lives or, you know, I mean, it was so easy for everyone to come out for Ukraine. Why is that? Like we need to look at sort of the obvious racial reasons behind that, um, particularly in light of Ukraine, right? When we were seeing a lot of things happen and you had people going on Western media and saying, oh, but these are like civilized people. I mean, we can't pretend that there isn't a racial component, you know, but, I think like, especially like on the issue of like black lives, um, something that I'm noticing and, you know, I hope that this is related and, and answers your question, but you know, the same people who like particularly white folks, like who stood up for black lives have nothing to say now. And it just, sometimes it makes me wonder like if their solidarity was ever real, you know, it's like, were you saying this because, you know, you felt like you had to was this genuine and then you know those same folks are actually coming out and um i want to say even like harassing a lot of black folks who are speaking in solidarity with palestine so it's just it's very interesting like how conditional people's solidarity can truly be and i think at the end of the day it's just people are so afraid to say the wrong thing that they'd rather say nothing at all and I think also because this has been painted as this complicated issue, right? I mean, that's sort of the story that we've been fed for such a long time. Um, yeah, people are, they're just afraid. And I think what they don't realize is that true solidarity means you might lose something, right? Like at the end of the day, if you're not willing to sacrifice, right? <sighs> yeah, there's a difference between like, sort of speaking up in a performative way and actually showing true solidarity with the cause. So I, I just hope that more people recognize that. And I mean, what we're seeing is so clear. And if you think that it's unclear, you're probably listening to the wrong people. So. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, thank you for that answer, Layla. And I think, you know, um, Something you mentioned uh, was sacrifice. And in that vein, um, there have been many musicians and many artists and actors who have come out in support of Palestine and have been punished for it in various ways, right? Um, and I'm wondering if you, in your personal life, I mean, I'm sure you've supported Palestine for a very long time. Have you ever experienced any of those repercussions or known any other artists who have? As far as me as an artist, like it's kind of hard to say because it's possible that certain opportunities just aren't coming in because of this. Like, you know, my sister and I played Lincoln Center this past summer with our band. And, you know, we both had the conversation of like, mm, it's possible those gigs won't come through anymore. And at the same time, um, I think that the pro-Palestine movement is so strong that there are a lot of things that will come through because of it. 
Um, you know, I can say personally as a voice teacher and a piano teacher, I did lose a, a student that I've had for seven years over this issue. And this was before I started releasing music about Palestine. Well, not releasing music, but like putting stuff online, um, making covers and stuff like that. But yeah, I was just posting on Pal about Palestine on my page. And, you know, basically the mother um, of the, the student said that I hated white people because I was talking about white supremacy culture and how it feeds into this. And, you know, it's just, um, it, it's very upsetting. I mean, I had a beautiful relationship with that student. Um, and, you know, I hope when she's older one day that she learns and can reflect. That was a really difficult loss for me. Um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm very grateful to say that I, for the most part, I haven't lost too much because I work for myself. So I think that's also the particular reason why I feel like I have to speak up the way that I do, because I have less to lose than a lot of folks. And I recognize that that puts me in a particular position where, you know, I have a responsibility to speak up, you know, and I think even if you are going to lose something, I mean, we do live under capitalism, so you have to be able to eat. And I understand that. But yeah, we have to be willing to lose opportunities. Um, you know, and then I wonder, like, you know, I've made these covers of popular songs and like the Taylor Swift cover, for example, has like over 8 million views and uh, so many people have tagged Taylor Swift. And it's like, well, has Taylor seen this? People are begging her to speak out. Like, we'll wait. I don't think she will, but I would love to see her speak out. Same goes for Beyonce. I don't, I don't have any faith that that's going to happen, but it's like, you know, if you have this massive platform and you're not saying anything, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know. I just feel like people are so afraid to piss other people off that they just don't want to say anything. It's like, well, sometimes you have to piss off certain people to stand with what's right. You have to be okay with that. A big theme in your music is the U.S.'s funding of the Zionist state. What does it mean to you that the U.S. funds Israel, upwards of billions of dollars each year, as someone who lives in the United States? So, I mean, this has been an issue that has enraged me for so long. Um, but I think, you know, the thing that really radicalized me, like even before this genocide was, you know, in the year 2020, I didn't have health insurance. And, you know, that's kind of when my own chronic condition started to show symptoms. And I just remember like, you know, being so fed up with the discourse around, especially like the, the topic of healthcare and, oh, it's too expensive and, oh, it's this and, oh, it's that. And then it's like, well, we can afford to go to war every time we can afford to fund genocide. And this isn't, this isn't a war, this is a genocide. Um, but it's, I'm really tiring of the excuses for why we can't take care of people in the United States. And, you know, I can honestly say, like, as someone with a system, with a, a condition that affects the nervous system, right, that, you know, not having health care, it made me sicker. <laughs> like, you know, because what happened was I had to be my own, I had to be my own doctor. I had to, like, watch my symptoms like a hawk. Um, and it, it led, it actually fed more chronic pain, you know, which if you actually learn about the science of pain and how it, it sort of develops from a state of hypervigilance actually around your symptoms, you know, I might not be here today if I were able to see a doctor in the first place. So it's, I have a particular rage around what the United States spends money on. And it's, there's so much more than just healthcare. I mean, you know, it's, it's. I'm, I'm at an age where a lot of my friends and, you know, people I know are having children and it's so difficult to have children in the United States in a way that it isn't in other countries because other countries actually take care of their people and they have leave and things that like just make sense for a population to thrive. And, you know, so when I see the United States like funding this genocidal apartheid state and just literally putting um, profit over people and ruining lives, quite frankly. It, it just, I can't even describe the rage that I feel. And yeah, that's uh, it's part of why I focus on that issue so much because it's really deeply personal to me. And it, you know, it's affected me on a, a great kind of mass level. I think if there's anything 
if there's anything I would like to highlight, you know, just especially as a person who can't always protest, right? Because again, I just never know how I'm going to feel that day. I never know if I'm going to have the strength to stand there for four hours and listen to speakers in the cold. And, you know, I'm a spoonie. It could cost me my spoons, um, if you know that term. So, you know, like we can all show up however we know how to show up. And it's going to look different for everybody, but how, whatever you have, whatever your tools are, just use them.